Friends, I'd like to invite you to take up your Bible, please, and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is page 953 if you're using one of our church Bibles, and I'd like to read for us verses 6 through 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6. The Apostle Paul writes, Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom. Although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Let's pray together as we begin. God, our Father, we want to praise you and thank you that you have revealed your secret and hidden wisdom in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and through the apostles, that we might know it and receive it. We thank you for the extraordinary things that you have prepared for those who love you in glory. We pray that you would teach us your wisdom more deeply this morning as we turn to the pages of your word, and we pray that you would cause us to delight in the truth and to return praise to you for it. For we pray it in our Savior's name. Amen. For us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, one of the very surprising things about the Christian gospel, about the preaching of the gospel, is how often and how widely it is rejected. Often the gospel message is not particularly well received. Often it falls on deaf ears or unappreciative hearts, often the good news of Jesus, which is so, so wonderful to our ears, so refreshing to our hearts, it's meaningless or worse to others around us. And it's so very, very surprising. Paul, for his part, has been very realistic about his preaching and its reception. He knows that his preaching is not impressive to the world. He knows that he doesn't speak with the polish of the finest orators of the day, nor with the impressive worldly wisdom of the philosophers of the age. His description of his ministry at Corinth is disarmingly humble. Chapter 2 and verse 3, you remember this, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom." Paul acknowledged all that very freely. But lest we imagine that he thought that his message was truly lacking, that he thought that the gospel he proclaimed was in any way inferior to the message of the philosophers of the age, he now turns to show us the true nature and value of his message. He now turns to consider the wisdom of God, which is the very heart of his message. Paul makes it clear that we will only understand the surprising reception of the gospel message, the surprising lack of interest and the rejection by so many people, we are only going to understand that 
once we understand the very nature of the wisdom of God, which is, of course, the heart of his message. Now, the wisdom of God is not a new theme in this letter. Paul has already introduced and actually defined it for us back in chapter 1. Just glance back there with me, if you would, for a moment. Chapter 1 and verse 22 Paul writes, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is himself the very wisdom of God. And the message of Christ crucified, the message that Christ came and died on a Roman cross to purchase our salvation, this surprising, even shocking message that God's promised king should do such a thing, that message is the very wisdom of God. And Paul wants to say, look, my my preaching, it may not be all that impressive to the world, but I do speak and I do preach the very wisdom of God. I do that, at least, he says, among the mature, chapter 2 and verse 6. I've got wisdom to impart, true wisdom, God's own wisdom. And so Paul's focus in our passage today is to unfold the nature of that surprising wisdom, rejected by the world but treasured by the saints, three features of the wisdom of God, the wisdom given to Paul to proclaim, and the first one is this, the wisdom of God is hidden to the world. Notice it with me, verse 6 again. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. For those who have been given spiritual insight, the spiritual maturity to see it, and note the uh, implied rebuke for the Corinthians who are dismissive of Paul's preaching, among the mature, Paul says, I have a true wisdom to impart, but you need to be clear about one thing. This is not like the wisdom you will hear or encounter anyone anywhere else. Notice what this wisdom is not like, verse 6. It is not a wisdom of this age. You see, this wisdom, it belongs to another age and another world. It belongs actually to the world to come. That's where this wisdom will shine and be visible and make perfect sense. You see, a crucified Christ is a model of shame and an object of rejection in this age. He was ignored by many, disregarded, disrespected, derided, and disdained. He was treated as a criminal, hung upon a Roman cross. Even today, his name is so often used as a term of scorn and worse. But but in the age to come, the Christ will be seen upon his throne and in his kingdom, and people from every tribe and language and nation and tongue will bow before him. Every knee will bow at the name of Jesus Christ. In an age to come, when the Lord Jesus Christ judges the world and makes all things new, when his glory is revealed and his people live in the joy and the blessing of his immediate presence, in that age, the wisdom of the cross, the wisdom of Christ crucified will be seen and will be understood and will be appreciated. You see, the wisdom of the gospel in a fundamental way belongs to that age. And so the believer is therefore fundamentally a person of the future. Now, there are people like that, aren't there? Scientists, engineers, even philosophers and leaders who see the world not so much as it is, but as it could be and it might be. Some people, they just seem to be ahead of their time. They seem to belong to an age yet to come. Uh, Not long ago, it was reported that Raymond Moriyama, one of uh, Canada's most famous architects, had passed away at the age of 93. Perhaps you saw that. Moriyama was responsible for a number of iconic buildings in Canada, some familiar to you, perhaps the Ontario Science Centre, Toronto Central Reference Library, the Ottawa City Hall, Canadian War Museum, and others. Now, whether or not one shared Moriyama's architectural taste, it was clear that he was a visionary of sorts. And his, many of his buildings really do look as though they belonged to a future age. He was someone of whom we might say that he was, he was ahead of his time. Or, or perhaps we might think back further in history and consider a figure like Leonardo da Vinci, who in the 1480s conceived of a flying machine something like a modern helicopter. 
the, the materials, the technology to build an aircraft like that it wouldn't exist for another 400 years and more. But da Vinci could see it and imagine it. He drew out a model of it while working as a military engineer. He was a person of the future. Visionaries are like that. Great leaders and artists and inventors, they often are indeed people of the future. Well, so is the Christian believer. So is the preacher of the gospel. What we proclaim and what we believe, it belongs to the age that is to come. The wisdom of God, it doesn't belong to this age. And Paul adds, it does not belong to the rulers of this age, verse 6, who are doomed to pass away. Now, the rulers of this age, more often than not, reject the message of the gospel reject the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we saw in Jesus' life and ministry. The religious leaders, the political leaders, the world's great power brokers, they had no time for him. In fact, verse 8, they crucified him. If the rulers of the age had any real understanding of who Jesus was, they wouldn't have condemned and crucified him. They couldn't have done so. But, but they didn't see, and largely today they, they don't see, and the reason is simply this. The wisdom of God is secret, and the wisdom of God is hidden, says Paul. It's not available by normal and natural means of gathering information and gaining wisdom, verse 7, but we impart a secret and a hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. You know, you, you cannot put the gospel in a test tube and analyze it scientifically. You couldn't predict it. You couldn't even make it up if you tried. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of him crucified, it stems from the great wisdom of the Almighty, a plan set in place from before the ages began, a plan purposed for our glory, a plan that is to raise us from the mire of sin and the wreckage of the fall and to make us holy in Christ, to make us sharers in his glorious character and destined to be with him in the glory of his presence for all eternity. But who could have imagined it and who could have predicted it? Who could have predicted that the God of heaven would send his son into a world of tragedy and pain and moral filth to live among us and die for us, to redeem us, and then to bring us to glory? Who could have imagined it? It's inconceivable, actually. It sounds crazy. No one would make it up. No, this secret and this hidden wisdom of God had to be made known by divine revelation, by the special working of God. You know, I think we find it uh, confusing, frustrating, even shocking that the people of this age and the leaders of our society don't see the wonder and the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you ever feel that frustration? Why, why do our leaders so often stand opposed to Jesus and his word? Why is the legal framework of our culture turning against him and against his people? Why this antagonism? Why this rejection? Well, it's the same today as it was 2,000 years ago, and the Word of God here leads us to expect nothing else. The gospel is hidden, and it's got to be revealed, and even when it is preached, many don't understand it. None of the rulers of this age understood this, verse 8, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, but as it is written, what I, no eye has seen nor ear heard nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. It's wonderful what God has done and what God has prepared for us, but no one would dream of it. And apart from the grace of God, no one will understand it. Friends, we've got to learn to be unsurprised, profoundly unsurprised, that the people of this world and the leaders of our society do not see or understand the wonder of Jesus Christ and his gospel. You see, it's hidden to them. It makes no sense to their minds. That's the first feature of the wisdom of God. It is hidden to the world. But next, this wisdom of God has been revealed by the Spirit, verse 10. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. 
Despite the bogus claims of psychics, one person cannot hope to know the thoughts of another. I mean, I might guess at what you're thinking. You know, I might guess that you're thinking, how much longer is this sermon going to be? <laughs> uh, will I make my lunch reservation? Is he going to tell a good story at some point to make things go a little bit quicker? You know, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I might discern that some of you are thinking those thoughts, but you know, that is just an educated guess. I, I can't look at your face and see the secrets of your heart. No one can do that. We could try it the other way. D just do this. Try and imagine what I'm thinking just now. Take a guess. Not sure? Okay, I'll tell you. Apart from my sermon, which is somewhat on my mind at the moment, I'm thinking, uh, here's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about a department store on the island of Bermuda that I visited when I was a child. It's an old world store. It's called Trimmingham's. It's a fixture of island life for a century and more, but it shut down a number of years ago. I'm thinking about what it looked like, actually what it smelled like what it was to go in there as a child and explore the rows of brightly colored goods and see all the beautiful things that they had. Now, when I asked the question, did anyone guess that I was thinking about visiting Trimmingham's department store in Bermuda? Anyone? Special prize for you if you did. But no, I don't think so. How could you? You see, it was in my mind and not yours. You could only know if I told you. If the gospel of Jesus Christ is the secret wisdom of God, if it is something that he conceived in his mind, planned in his heart from all eternity past, then no one can know it without him letting us in on his secret. No one can know his wisdom, his message, his plan, unless he deigns to reveal his mind to us and to tell us. No one can know the significance of Jesus Christ and the wonder of what God has prepared, verse 9, for those who love him. No one can know except that God make it known. It's his mind, not our mind. But now Paul wants to make a very great claim. He wants to claim that as an apostle of Jesus Christ, as a chosen and selected messenger, he himself has been the recipient and beneficiary of God's self-revelation by the Spirit. God has let him and the other apostles and through them the church, God has let him in on the secret, verse 10. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except, that the, except the Spirit of that person which is in him. In the first instance here, Paul is speaking about himself as an apostle. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, us the apostles, verse 10, and we, that is Paul and his ministry associates, it's a kind of royal we, I guess, verse 13, impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. Now, we've got to remember that in the background here in 1 Corinthians is a challenge to Paul's own ministry. People were suggesting that it wasn't impressive enough, not enough oratory, not enough wisdom, not impressive to the world. And what's Paul saying? Paul's saying that in his privileged position, he has the very access to the mind of God through the work of the Spirit in the gospel. And as an apostle of Jesus Christ, he has this God-given responsibility and opportunity to impart this wisdom from God by words taught him by the very Spirit of God. Where has the apostle Paul spoken these words? Where do we access them? Consider that. We access them, of course, in the pages of Scripture, in his letters, here in 1 Corinthians and in the other New Testament books given by the Spirit-directed ministry of the apostles. Now, this gift of access to the mind of God comes to all believers through the Scriptures, but it's important to see that it comes through the apostolic ministry, comes through the Bible. That's what Paul is claiming here. And through that ministry by the Spirit, we believers together now have access to the mind of God, to the mystery of the gospel. It's here for us. God has opened up his mind, his mystery to us and for us in the apostolic writings in the pages of Scripture. We have the secret. We have the key. That's God's gracious gift to us in the gospel insight into the very mind of God. 
My friend Joy shared a story with me last week that struck a, card, a chord in my heart as I was preparing this message. He, he, he shared the story of a pastor in South India who was on a, a trip, I guess a ministry trip in the United States. He boarded a plane to his destination, but the, the flight actually got diverted for mechanical reasons, and they landed at another airport altogether unplanned. They were taken into the terminal and had a, a long wait, many hours. O over time, this man uh, said, you know, he grew more and more hungry, but he was being careful with his funds. I imagine his budget was limited, and he was hesitant to spend the money on this unplanned delay. Yeah, he saw the other passengers on his flight feasting on big meals from the various food outlets, but he was refraining. But eventually, hunger kind of overtook him, and he decided that he just had to go ahead and try and, and buy something. So he got in line with some of the other passengers at one of the food outlets and bought a little bite of lunch, which to him seemed terribly expensive. When the passengers were eventually recalled to the plane and he looked at his boarding pass, he saw a note there on his boarding pass that he hadn't yet seen. It said this, because of the delay, all meals in the terminal will be provided free for the passengers. The airline was paying. Costs were already covered. There was no need for him to pay. Others seemed to know all about this. The restaurants had all been informed, but no one had actually told him. He'd been starving. He's now trying to buy his food, couldn't really afford, but the secret was this, the meal had already been purchased. No one told him. Now, now this pastor tells of how that experience actually changed his outlook and his ministry and ultimately led to gospel growth in his context. And, and here's why it dawned on him in a new way that Christians steward a secret that others will not figure out on their own but which they desperately need to know. See, the price has been paid already. People out there, they are trying to purchase their salvation. They are trying to earn their salvation. They might be living in fear of the final bill at the judgment, but they don't know this. They don't know the secret. The price has already been paid. Now, the gospel message, the secret wisdom of God, no one is going to figure it out all on their own. It's not intuitive in that sense. It needs to be revealed. And it has been revealed to the apostles and to the church now in the scriptures, and now we have it. Now you and I know the mind of God and the message of salvation. What a privilege. And how we need to get that message out to those who cannot know without being told. The wisdom of God, it is hidden to the world, it has been revealed by the Spirit, and finally now, it is spiritually discerned. Verse 13, pick up the thread with me there if you would. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. I wonder if you've ever had the experience of waiting to receive a file electronically, maybe something you've been really anticipating and you really want to see, I don't know, a, a digital presentation from a colleague at work, a special photo album of the grandkids, a financial update from your advisor, something important that you want to see and you need to see, and you click on the link on your phone or your computer and it, it doesn't open. You get a message saying that you don't have the right, the right plug-in, the right software to see it, to view it, to receive it. You try various things. You download a, a read or a program. Nothing works. The important information, you know it's there in the file, but your system simply doesn't speak the right language, and you can't access it. You can't use it. You can't make sense of it. Now, the Christian gospel, praise God, is widely available. In many parts of the world, you can find it online. You can access it in the Gideon Bible in your hotel room. You can step into a church and hear it. The gospel is there. It's available, not everywhere, of course, but in many places. But here's the thing. For so many people, it's as though they don't have the right software in their mind and their heart to read it. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. The unspiritual person cannot receive the things of God because they do not have the internal capacity to understand it, to make sense of it, to interpret it. And Paul is saying that without the 
working of the Spirit of God in the life of that person, the gospel message will not make sense and it will remain folly. Now, at this point, it is profoundly important for us. It's profoundly important for us as we desire to make Jesus known to others and perhaps feel frustrated that our loved ones, our friends, our family see the gospel only as folly. We feel that sense of disappointment and frustration and sometimes sheer bewilderment, and we wonder, you know, why can't you just get this? You know, why won't you just receive this? The gospel is so wonderful after all. It makes such good sense to us. It's so coherent, but to them it's folly. And at that point, we need to pause and recognize that it is going to take the work of the Spirit of God in their heart and in their mind to make the gospel make any sense. And so what do we do? We need humbly to turn to the Lord in prayer and ask that he, by his spirit, would do that spiritual work of giving our loved ones, those for whom we have a gospel concern, giving them the capacity to make sense of the gospel, which will be naturally beyond them because it is spiritually discerned. See, this reminds us, doesn't it, of the profound necessity of prayer when it comes to missions and personal evangelism. We can proclaim and we can explain the gospel until we are blue in the face, but if God does not work by his spirit, In the hearts and minds of those who hear, the message, verse 14, will be unacceptable to them, and it will remain folly in their sight. If we are a people who would reach out with the gospel, we must be a people who will reach up in prayer and ask the Father to move by His Spirit to enable the spiritual discernment that is necessary for people to receive the gospel. There's an important implication here for you if you're someone who's exploring the faith. If you're wanting to know more, it's wonderful if you are. If you want to make sense of what you're hearing, it may be that you have the desire in your heart to find out about Jesus. You want to understand what Christians believe, what makes them different, why we have hope, but so far you just can't make sense of it. You're listening you're paying attention, but it's as though there's a a mental and spiritual wall in front of you, and you feel you can't make progress in understanding. I don't know if that's your experience. It will be for some. Well, it's no surprise, according to what Paul is telling us here. It's no surprise because it takes the work of the Holy Spirit of God to make sense of this profoundly spiritual message. And so for you, I want to say the thing for you to do is to cry out to God to pray to him, to ask him to give you the insight, the capacity to make sense of what you're hearing. I think that's the kind of prayer that God delights to hear and delights to answer. And he is the one who alone can give you the insight, can open your mind and the eyes of your heart to see and to understand and to believe. If you truly want to know, if you truly want to understand, have you asked God to do that for you, to give you the spiritual insight you crave and that you need? Why not ask him? Why not see what he might do? One of the great issues at the heart of 1 Corinthians is the question of what constitutes true spirituality. What does the truly spiritual person look like? What does the truly spiritual church look like? Those are important questions, of course. We need to grapple with them as believers. And if they've been much debated over the course of modern church history, I think Paul has something of an answer for us here. Is the truly spiritual person, the truly spiritual church, marked by a kind of, I don't know, emotional intensity, by the manifestation of particular gifts? Is such a church marked by a particular brand of corporate worship, maybe with the volume cranked up a little bit more, maybe a little bit more physical expression? Is that what spirituality looks like, authentic spirituality? Well, maybe, maybe not. But what does real spirituality look like according to our passage, according to the Apostle Paul, according to the Word of God? Isn't it this, according to our passage, isn't the spiritual person fundamentally the one who listens to and accepts the apostolic teaching, the gospel taught by Paul? Isn't the spiritual person the one who accepts the Word of God? received from the Lord and delivered by the apostles. Isn't the spiritual church, therefore, the church that is devoted to the apostolic writings, to the Holy Scriptures? Look again at verse 13 with me. 
And we, that is Paul and his apostolic associates, we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Spiritual people will understand and receive the wisdom Paul received from the Lord and imparts to us. His teaching has been written down in the Bible. Spiritual people will receive that, will understand that, will be devoted to it. You know, sometimes you hear caricatures, and maybe you've heard this, caricatures that say that some churches, you know, over here will be devoted to the Bible, while other churches over here will be devoted to the Spirit, or something like that. And it's sort of, you know, you choose one or the other. It's either a word church or a spirit church. You ever heard something like that? But the, the gist of the caricature is that churches devoted to the Bible might not really make room for the work of the Spirit. Now, that caricature is flawed and unhelpful on so many levels, but what Paul shows us here is the unbreakable connection between the work of the Spirit of God and the giving and receiving of biblical truth. The Spirit has enabled the giving of the Scriptures, and the heart of Christian spirituality is receiving and understanding the truth of God's Word. Spiritual people are fundamentally those who are devoted to Scripture. The Holy Spirit is at work powerfully in hearts and minds to enable the understanding of the Bible. You see, we cannot separate the Word of God and the Spirit of God. The two operate together because the Bible is the Spirit's book. Now, if we would be a truly spiritual people and a truly spiritual church. We must be a people who are devoted to the word that the Spirit gave, devoted to the very wisdom of God. The message is hidden to the world, yes, but it has been revealed by the Spirit through the apostles for the glorious hope of all who believe. Let's pray together as we finish. God, our Father, we thank you for the gracious gift of your self-revelation of your wisdom in Christ crucified made known to us through the apostles. We pray that you would cause us to be more and more a deeply spiritual people devoted to your word and devoted to the proclamation of that word. For we pray it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.